Adult education in California is a proud system with a history of being responsive to community, state, and national needs. The first recorded adult school in California was sponsored by the San Francisco Board of Education in 1856. Evening classes were taught in the basement of Old St. Mary's Church. Then, like now, many students were immigrants, in those days Irish, Italian, and Chinese. Subjects included adult literacy and vocational subjects, such as drafting and bookkeeping. John Sweat, one of the first volunteer teachers at St. Mary's and principal at Lincoln School from 1868 to 71, convinced the board to make the adult program tuition-free, beginning another enduring tradition. In the last half of the century, evening schools were established in other large cities, such as Sacramento, Oakland, San Jose, and Los Angeles. By the turn of the century, evening schools were well established as Americanization centers. Well, growing up, my mom was on drugs, so my grandmother raised me and my three sisters. And my mom was kind of in and out of our lives, so it was difficult when not having her around. My father, um, he was not in my life as well. Um, he went to prison when I was young, about two years old, and he died when I was 10 in prison. Um, so not having him around was also tough. But my grandma, she was, she was the backbone of the family. She held it together. You know, having circumstances where everyone can't have, you know, in life two parents in the household. And how do you survive that? You know? And he did, having a grandma there who came in and, um, you know, gave him that parental guidance and love. I was always a good student. It's just I got caught up with the wrong crowd, hanging with the wrong people, trying to fit in, you know, peer pressure as a teenager is tough. So um, I think about ninth grade, um, I took took summer two months early and uh, I never went back. Trevon is someone who's a self-made, there's no doubt about it. You know, he had a hard go when he was younger and went through some trying times. And then by the time he got to our school, he had turned things around and had, had the right plan, the right attitude. He's always been a hard worker. You know, had, uh, he had his own business, uh, landscaping, and, you know, just doing a number of things, a number of jobs. I came to Fremont Adult, signed up, and when I had my little orientation, the lady was like, what do you want to do? You want to get your GED or you want to get your high school diploma? And she said, if you get your GED, take you six months. So if you want to get your high school diploma, it's going to take you about two and a half years. And I was like, I want to get my high school diploma. I want the real deal. He was taking advantage very quickly of every option that we developed for our students. Uh, we're very fortunate to have classroom-based instruction. He was coming to morning classes, afternoon, evening classes. Um, we had a, a high school learning center, a self-paced learning environment, and he was taking advantage of that to accelerate his progress towards uh, achieving his diploma. When he came to us, his writing skills were a bit behind. He was really only a freshman in standing when he came, so he had like three years of high school work to do. It took him two years, but you know, he did, um, we had a lot of uh, trials, you know, and, and tribulations, but he got through it. That early training um, at Fremont really prepared me and, and gave me the confidence I needed to, to know I could succeed on the next level. And from Fremont Adult, I went to Patton University, four years, got my bachelor's in clinical psychology. 
And after that, I wanted to further my education. So I applied to graduate school, to a doctor program. He's achieved a lot. Uh, he's has a lot of awards from Patton University. And um, with him getting his diploma here, he, uh, they wanted him to speak at the ceremony. You know, they chose him and, you know, he'd get different scholarships. He's doing good. And, and I, I just, I am very proud of him. He's a role model for the kids. And, and that's the, that's the, that, that's the number one thing I love about Trevon being in school because it affects our children. So I think me going back to school has tremendously affected my children as well as uh, my circumstances with my, my entire family. I think it's been a blessing. It's been really an honor and a privilege to work with him as a student and to see his success now. He's going to make a difference in a lot of people's lives. He is. I mean, a young black male with his doctorate degree, you know, helping his people and all people very powerful. It doesn't happen every day. My advice for students coming into Fremont Adult or any adult school for that matter is to just to be focused. Know what you want. Know what you're after. This is going to better your life. This is going to better your family's life. And, and just know that you're accomplishing this for you. Um, nobody can ever take this away from you. From this slide, we can see that there has been a trend toward decreased enrollment in all regions of the nation over the period from 2004-05 through 2010-11. But still, California as a single state, as of 2010-11, served one-fifth of the nation's adults. This slide compares the distribution of students enrolled in the types of WIA Title II programs among the various regions in the country and California for 2010-11. The data indicate that California had the highest percent enrollment in ESL as compared to that of other Western states and other regions in the nation. Conversely, California had one of the lower enrollment percentages in the nation for ABE, ASE, with the southern region having the highest. Uh, I see you have these uh, partnerships and collaborations. How does that figure in in following up the students uh, as you are uh, following, the, uh, following them for their uh, core performance outcomes. Yes, we find that students who um, are attracted to transition programs are highly motivated. Highly motivated students have, have high persistence. And high persistence means for us that it affords us the opportunity for better data collection and analysis. Uh, we are uh, better able to have paired scores for our CASAS testing and we are better able to track students' progress both within our organization and when we uh, follow them and work with them in, a, in, a co in the collaboration with our partners at the, in this case, the other campus is an example. And then keeping in touch with a student is very important. We find that phone communication and email uh, is critical, but the most important factor we think really is the teacher's connection to the student. We find that when the teachers have created this community of learners in the classroom, the cohort begins to move together in their progress and it's much easier for us to keep in communication with them. The teacher will find the students communicating with them on a more regular and frequent basis even when they have uh, transition from the program into the next step of the program. So this has been uh, very helpful to us to gather better data and over a longer period of time and also to have uh, more data to work with.
that our project is really centered around preparing students so that they were truly ready for, uh, for college. Um, and so we focused primarily on the support services. The centerpiece of our project, which was called College Bound, uh, was really um, augmenting and developing um, you know, specific, intensive, one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, you know, career and college counseling. This was a need area that they had expressed, that you know, as they were finishing their GED and high school diplomas, they were typically uh, apprehensive about you know, what the next steps were, what the next options were, and really how to you know, go about that process of, of making that transition effectively and following through. What we were able to do this year is work with a cohort of students um, and it was funded by a policy to performance grant and we were one of ten agencies selected statewide to receive the grant and so it provided some of the funding support to hire uh, a full-time college and career counselor uh, as well as other support uh, activities and so some of the highlights of the program were really our partnerships and collaborations with local community colleges and our local workforce inve uh, investment development centers. So as soon as we had um, you know, someone on board and someone on our, on our campus who could assist students with this process on a one-on-one -on -one basis, the feedback we've gotten from teachers and support staff as well as students has really been overwhelmingly positive, so that's been really satisfying because we feel like we've really filled a need that we had been hearing about for quite some time. We learned a lot and we certainly plan to carry many of these elements forward uh, into uh, the coming years. And so sustainability was obviously a huge part of uh, this project because we didn't want the project to end or this effort to end uh, when the grant funding uh, would run out. As a career college counselor, I uh, work with the GED and high school students. I visit the classroom for orientation. I introduce them uh, the benefits that you get out of it. So I, I, I have this one student and I can never forget her because one day she walked in my office and she tells me that she's devastated. She feels very discouraged because she's not doing well in her GED class and she doesn't know what to do in the future. So we spent some time and I encourage her that, you know, finish your GED. Uh, while you're doing your GED, take some classes at the local community college. She has four kids working and going to school and taking classes at the community college at the same time. In the last four months, she has gotten herself four classes done at the community college and will be um, majoring in uh, registered nursing. Without the assessments, I cannot plan my instruction. Assessments is the number one most important thing for me when a student comes in. If I don't assess that student, I don't know exactly what it is they need. And the whole point about EBRI is identifying those needs and then tackling those needs. So without assessment, I wouldn't be able to run my class. Initially, it was very difficult to assess the students because whenever you do something new, of course, it's going to be hard. But the more I did it, the more I did it, the easier it got. Now, it's not difficult at all. Evidence-based reading instruction has benefited my instruction because I really believe it starts with the assessment. In the past, students would come to me with a TAPE score. And so I would base my plan of instruction solely on that score, but I wasn't getting the results I wanted to see. But with EBRI, I'm able to get a really well-rounded picture of the student, and I can focus specifically on what they need. Okay, good morning class. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for moving to the tables, I appreciate it. We're gonna move on to comprehension, like my agenda says over here, comprehension. Today we're gonna be working on finding the topic. Okay, many of you 
uh, have expressed that uh, you need help in understanding paragraphs. Yes? Yes. Okay, well today we're going to be learning how to identify the topic. Because really, in order to get the main idea of a paragraph, the first step you got to do is identify the topic. Okay? Now, what is a topic? Basically, the topic is what something is about. It's that simple. What is this picture about? Tell me the topic. What is this paragraph about? Tell me the topic. What is this passage about? Tell me the topic. The topic is, what is this about? So let me show you what I do using a picture whenever I have to identify a topic. So I look at this picture. I look at this picture here, and I think, OK, well, hmm, the topic. What is this picture about? Well, this picture to me, I see a Christmas tree. I see presents. I see a fireplace. OK, well, t this, the topic of this picture to me is Christmas. Christmas, OK? I see that it's not about the Christmas tree. It's not about the presents. The whole topic is Christmas. OK. So would you agree with me that this is, the topic is Christmas? Yes. yes. Yeah. OK. Somebody asked me, what's this picture about? Usually in one word or in a couple of words of phrase, I'll tell them, the topic of this picture is Christmas. OK. I feel good about this. I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm doubting. No. This is about Christmas. Now. Now, a paragraph has a lot of sentences together, and they're all talking about one topic. Okay? Let me show you what I do when I see a paragraph. People throughout history have liked mustard. Huh. I like mustard. Mustard has been a popular spice in cooking for more than 5,000 years. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, a cookbook written in 3000 BC mentions mustard. Wow, that's a long time ago. Ancient Egyptians, Chinese, Greeks, and Romans all used mustard. The Spanish took it with them when they sailed to the New World. Okay, well, I keep, I keep seeing the word mustard, 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 mustard. Okay, you know, I think the topic of this paragraph, it's got to be mustard. It's got to be mustard, okay? Now, you guys, I could have said cooking. I could have said spices. I could have said ancient people. But all of those would have just been small details of the story. Somebody asks me, and they don't have time, what did you read about today? I'll say mustard. Okay, mustard. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do one together. Okay, we're going to read a paragraph and we're going to identify what the topic is. We're going to ask ourselves questions. What is this about? Okie dokie. Now, can everybody see this? Paris, France is one of the world's most famous cities. It is famous for important structures such as the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre Museum, and Notre Dame Cathedral. All right, what would you say the topic of this paragraph is? Paris, France. Paris, France. One more time? Paris, France. Okay, all right, good, good. How did that feel? Was that, was that good? Yeah. Was that comfortable? Yes. Yeah? All right, good. Any questions? Any questions? Now what we're going to do is we're going to separate into your comprehension groups, and then you're going to try and uh, figure out, identify the topics for paragraphs at your particular groups. Sound like a good idea? Yes. All right, so I'm going to be moving you guys around. All right, so you guys, so we identified the topic of 
one paragraph, Paris, France, very good. Now, realistically, what's going to happen is I'm going to give you an assignment, and you're going to have to find the topic of not just one paragraph, but more than one paragraph. In this case, four paragraphs. So what I'd like to show you is how I go about in identifying the topic of each paragraph. Okay. Let's try paragraph two, but this time we're going to do it together. Yes? Let's try paragraph two, and we're going to do it together. Help me out here. What do you guys think? It's talking about the lion's power. You know, that's what I, actually, that's what I was thinking, too. It, it does talk about the, the paws and the claws, and it also talks about the teeth, but both of those refer to the power the lion has. Now, one more. Now, this last one, I want you guys to do it on your own. Ask yourself, what is this paragraph about in one word or in a couple of words? Any, any, does, any ideas, any suggestions? How the lion hunts. How the lion hunts. What did you say, Jorge? About the lion's prey. The preference of the lion or, or large prey. The, so the prey, you're going back to prey. All right. Now let me ask you this, if, if you tell me that this paragraph is about the prey, is it only talking about the different types of animals? No. It's only talking about animals. No. How the lion hunts those animals, right? Well, my name is uh, Maria Ramirez, and uh, I have a 12-year-old son. And I'm in this, in this reading class because I need to improve my reading skills to help be able to help my son in his reading and his grammar. And um, this class is really helping me. Um, uh, Miss Margie, she's been telling us all kinds of details to be able to read better, um, to improve all kinds of um, different uh, strategies to be, a, to be a better reader. So it's been wonderful. Having this uh, reading class to me is great because now I can help my son with his homework. Before I was a little bit worried because you know, now you're in fifth grade and they're reading high level. And so now that I feel great because I can help him with homework. I can read along with him. Like if he can pronounce something, I help him. It's been wonderful for me. It's great. So uh, the class, we're calling it the Fast Track Employment Skills, and that's what our uh, promising practice was based on the development and implementation of this class, which is a transition class. It first began by our uh, participation in the WCSC pilot project through CASAS and California Department of Ed. And uh, by participating in that project, we got involved in looking at the LRI, which is a video testing system, and combined with CASAS reading and math testing, you get a better, uh, a better picture of a student's abilities academically and also in terms of their soft skills and sort of workplace readiness. I decided to do an initial pilot with my ESL students. Um, so I did one six-week module with them and they were really game and they did all the testing and got into the instructional, you know, I just tried out different books and different units just to see how they would respond. And we decided to take it to another level in the fall and we did the sort of second pilot which was uh, we call an inclusive classroom which brought together um, 
advanced ESL students, GED students, um, students completing their high school diploma, of course all of these students are over 18, and then we had a fourth group which were students wanting to enter career tech ed or entering career tech ed but at the very beginning of their program by taking the, the fast track class uh, they would focus on reading skills, some math skills, soft skills, workplace expectations, career exploration. These are all the kind of the pieces of the class. And in general, the students, if they were career tech focused, they could bring their scores up within six to 12 weeks, enough to enter the career tech program. Um, the high school diploma students, they're allowed to get high school elective credit. So by taking the class, it gave them an additional class that they could add to their high school diploma. Uh, working towards their diploma, so they were excited about that. We did testing, pre and post testing, CASAS, math, and LRI with this group. A lot of people report to me that they felt more confident, they went on job interviews, uh, they told me that the questions they were asked in the job interviews were questions they had prepared for by practicing in the class, and so that was uh, validating to me that I was on track with the types of questions that um, you know we would have them prepare for. So one particular student I have in mind was an ESL student of mine for several years. So she started in very ambitious, hardworking. She's a mother of four and a grandmother, but just really wanted to to advance her own education. So she uh, this year after taking the fast track class, she also completed her GED, got graduated in our GED program and it just called me last week to ask if she could use my name as she's applying to uh, jobs at, at Pete's Coffee. And so that brings in that she has the confidence to go out and apply for a job, also that her English skills are now to the point um, where she feels confident to go out and apply for a job. Uh, another student, I had a disabled student who is, uh, has spina bifida. She was in my class for two sessions. Uh, I said, well, what is your goal? And she said, I really want to go to college. And I said, well, you know, why don't we go ahead and see if you can apply to the community college. So her family is all immigrants and she needed some support. So she is attending Chabot College now. One of the options that we're looking at is making the Fast Track Employment Skills class a module required for high school graduation. Again, all of our high school students are over 18, but they could really use these skills. These are critical skills. Um, another option has to do with creating like a pre-apprenticeship skills class, create a pathway between our school and some of the uh, union trade apprenticeship programs. One way I integrate technology is using the um, interactive whiteboard. Um, we use it for reading. It helps to keep the students um, on the same page. I've scanned in a lot of the pages, but it's also hands-on. The students um, go up to the board and they will drag words and put them in, fill in blanks. Um, they also have to do the writing. Um, I also use it in my uh, writing class where um, we can actually move sentences around. We can do the brainstorming. We'll do all the brainstorming and then we'll move it to another page and we'll write sentences for each one of our ideas. With the smart board and the notebook, uh, notebook software, they can actually, I can access a video, I can access uh, as an attachment um, a handbook that maybe goes over rules that I'm using in class. When I do the paragraph editing, um, students will ask a question about a rule and I said, oh, let's take a look at it. For many people, they're glorified whiteboards or uh, um, trans uh, overhead projectors. But Susan, as always, is able to find the really exciting things that you can do with it and so she makes it so that there's games. At one time, we were doing interactive things between our two sites and my students could actually do things on her board. So I put on the, the uh, headset and so I was talking to her students and my students were completing a crossword going up and writing on the board. And to our amazement, her uh, students started writing on our smart board. She's a great motivating factor for our other instructors. And, and I've seen some of the things she's done in the classroom using smart boards. And most teachers will just use, they'll start out using a smart board as something to lecture in front of. They may as well just have a sheet. 
Uh, then they see what she does and they are blown away and they see how progress the students are making and they just want to press it even further. I'm able to take uh, student essays and scan them and put them up on the board. And you would think they would be afraid, but they're not. They want to see their work up on the board. And as a class, we'll go through and offer suggestions to help them with their writing. We make a very comfortable environment for our students. And so they're very willing to help each other. And the smart board, the students just watch for a few times. And then as soon as they've watched, they know they can do it. And they're up there and they're writing on the board. When uh, a student's having difficulty with Play-Doh, we'll project Play-Doh up onto the board, but I can write on it and um, write on the, the actual web page and uh, um, work a problem out and then we'll close the ink layer and then put in the answer. And with the um, highlighter, I can outline, you know, I can show them, well, it's right here, you know, and these are the rules about commas. And also with the United Streaming, I can also pull up a video. Hey, well, let's, let's watch a video on commas. And it's all right there together, packaged. Kind of fun to see the staff so enthused about it. We've, um, you know, Susan's a big part of that. Seeing what she does in the classroom, we've been, we've actually sent our adults with disabilities instructors, people working in facilities, um, to go to training in her classroom. And now they all want smart boards. So it's, she's probably gonna cost me money, but uh, it's good to have someone like her really driving this kind of change.